Good afternoon, and welcome to the 26th annual UCCS Economic Forum. My name is David Siegel. I'm the Executive Director here at the N Center for the Arts at UCCS, and I will be serving as your MC during today's event. We'd like to thank all our partners who've made this event possible, and we thank each of you who have taken time out of your day to be part of the event, including all of our elected officials. Now, please help me wel welcome Dr. Venkat Reddy, Chancellor of UCCS. Good afternoon. So this is like I'm on a vacation seeing so many people at one spot. It's been a long time that we actually had this many folks together and uh, long overdue. Uh, but welcome to the 26th annual UCCS Economic Forum. It's wonderful to see you all here today. And this forum wouldn't be possible without the support of many of you in this room. So thank you so much for your support. that we arrived at the 26th. It was great to see the vibrant campus back again. I started hearing the complaints about parking. We can't find parking on campus. So that also kind of felt good <laughs> that we have faculty, staff, and students with smiling faces. They couldn't sp stop smiling. So we did, again, wait for a long time for this, but it was exciting to see that, that the work we do for our students is back in life on the campus. So each year that we gather for this event feels different. This year especially has presented us with economic challenges that have risen one after the another. Times like these remind me of the importance of the Economic Forum for giving us clarity on what's to come. So I can't wait to hear what our economists have to share today. So here at UCCS, our role is not just to respond to short-term forecasts but to prepare our students for their entire future careers. That means they must be able to adapt to changing markets and industries over the course of decades. So what we are doing is really giving them that foundation so that they can take care of these changes. As a university, we must look far into the future to determine the industries that will need their skills. So I'm proud to see that three new programs recently launched at UCCS programs in social work, cybersecurity, aerospace engineering. These fields are in need of the workforce of the future. We are proud that our skilled graduates are already helping to fill critical gaps in these industries with many more on the way. I'm also proud of our new two plus two partnerships that we're building with Pikes Peak State College and other community colleges in Southern Colorado. These strong partnerships will help us produce more college graduates, fill critical workforce needs, increase diversity, equity, and inclusion in our programs, and make more opportunities available for students who need financial support. These efforts don't just help students or the university. I always like to say, when we help our students succeed, we are helping the communities we serve succeed as well. And I hope you see that every single day. And research shows as that college graduates are more likely to vote, more likely to lead healthy lifestyles. They earn more over their lifetimes, and they're more likely to give philanthropic support. So I'm deeply thankful of everything our community does to support UCCS. And in turn, I'm proud of all that we do to make our community a better place to live. Before I turn over the microphone, I have a final big thank you. As you may know, Tatiana Bailey, Executive Director of the Economic Forum, wanted to expand her horizons <laughs> and want to move on to new pastures. And I was fortunate to bring Tatiana to the campus when I was the Dean of the Business School. I just want to thank her for her many years of service to UCCS and to this community so Tatiana, we wish you the very best. I know you're not going too far, so thank you again. Please join me in giving Tatiana a great thank you. And it's my pleasure to welcome Karen Markell, Dean of the College of Business.
Welcome to this packed house. It's awesome. This is my first in-person economic forum, and I'm just so thrilled to be here. Um, we're excited to be hosting the annual economic forum today. The success of this event over the past 26 years is the direct result of the active partnership and participation year after year from our business community. Thank you so much for your ongoing support. I'd also like to offer a special thank you to our forum founders, Dr. Tom Zwerlein, Dr. Jeff Ferguson, and Ron Chernak for their vision and efforts in making this local economic forum possible. Since 1997, the UCCS Economic Forum has, just, has been just one example of how the College of Business partners with the community. Our mission states we are prioritize and empower learners at every stage of their educational journey, develop innovative research that contributes to scientific discovery and effective business practice, and serve as a hub for our community in productive discourse practical learning, and social responsibility. The Economic Forum has been providing targeted economic information to drive business and government decisions to greater Colorado Springs. And our academic programs aim to produce students to serve your workforce needs. We have a successful history of working side by side to build the strength of the college in our region, and we look forward to identifying new, innovative ways to support, our, to support our local workforce in the years to come. As we all know very well from the last couple of years, forecasting the next year and even the next few months is challenging. That is why we all look to experts to provide insights into our economic future. We look forward to hearing a timely presentation today from our forum director, Dr. Tatiana Bailey, regarding our state and national economy as well as from a workforce development panel addressing the linchpin to sustainable economic development, hosted by Dr. Bailey, Ron Fitch, Joe Garcia, Kimmelin Harris, and Catherine Keegan. I also want to thank all of our partners, specifically our platinum partners, Bank of America, the FBB Group, Merrill Lynch, and Ent Credit Union, and our gold partners, the Community College of Aurora, Pikes Peak Workforce Center, and a special thank you to our media partners, Colorado Springs Business Journal, The Gazette, and Fox 21 News. We also wish to thank our nearly 50 silver and sustaining level partners. Not only do our partners support the forum financially, but they also provide their expertise and use their business connections to help bring you an outstanding program. We are grateful to host the 26th UCCS Economic Forum in person as we look ahead towards a very bright future in Colorado Springs. I'll be back to close our event later this afternoon with some exciting announcements and a special thank you to Dr. Bailey. I hope you enjoy, enjoy today's programs. Thank you, Dr. Markle. Now we're pleased to share a few words from the mayor of Colorado Springs, the Honorable John Southers. Hello everyone, I'm Colorado Springs Mayor John Southers. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the UCCS Economic Forum. This is an important event where you can gain good, unbiased, and well-sourced data to help you plan for the future. As some of you may know, this is my last year as mayor after serving two terms. And during that time, I received my fair share of complaints. But even the complaints make me feel good about our progress. People used to complain about the condition of our roads. They said we didn't have enough new construction, not enough cranes. And they said young people were leaving Colorado Springs. Now they call my office and complain about all the road construction. They're upset about all the cranes. And some even claim our city's being overrun by young people. We have consistently been named as the most desirable place to live in the country. And a big reason for that is our economic growth. With a current population of about a half million people, Cower Springs has grown from the 42nd to 39th largest city in the country. While our population growth has been steady, our economic growth has been exponential. The gross domestic product of Cower Springs metropolitan area has grown by a third over the past eight years, from 30 to $40 billion annually. Our city's economy is now ranked among the top 10 municipal economies in the country driven by both job growth and wage growth. 
We've created about 47,000 jobs since 2015. We're also among the top 10 cities in America where college graduates want to live. The reality is you cannot create the 5,500 jobs needed annually to accommodate our graduating children and grandchildren who want to live here without growing. And the fact is, all healthy cities grow. I'm proud of the state of our economy and grateful to you for your investment and interest. Thank you for your dedication to Colorado Springs, Olympic City, USA. Our presenting partner is Bank of America. Please welcome Mr. Jason Edelman, Director and Market Executive of Merrill Mountain Plains, Bank of America. All right, well, thank you. First of all, let me just thank the group, the team that put this together, the 26th Annual UCCS uh, uh, Economic Forum. It's really great to get everybody together. I know last year wasn't, uh, wasn't as lucky, but it's really good to have everybody together. So my name is Jason Edelman. I am a Managing Director with Merrill Lynch and Bank of America. I'm part of the Colorado Leadership Team. And on behalf of all of our associates in Colorado, everybody, uh, we are proud to return, to return as a proud sponsor of this economic forum. Uh, this event is truly part of our continued commitment to make financial lives better by connecting our clients, our employees, and our communities to the resources that they really need and deserve to be really, really successful. Uh, our expertise and resources provide us with the opportunity to really play an important role in helping to build thriving economies around the world and then right here in Colorado Springs as well. Uh, in fact, when you look at you know, uh, Merrill Lynch's wealth management, private bank, uh, Bank of America's consumer and commercial banking capabilities, we can pretty much do everything under the sun and we, we incorporate that into the, to the help that we provide the communities. Um, we are deeply involved through our work with powerhouse partners like UCCS and uh, Pikes Peak Habitat for, for Humanity who are focused on building and strengthening our city and our communities. This economic forum brings together visionary leaders, which you're going to see, right, and, and many of you in the room as well, uh, who have made a commitment to drive our economy forward. You heard from the, from the uh, mayor as well. So we're proud to be one of those leaders, just one of those leaders in the community by providing resources uh, to advance the, econom the economy and social progress as well. And we do this through a variety of different ways, many different ways, but a few examples. One is the deployment of capital. Right? So the deployment of capital to businesses, entrepreneurs, to get them going to help them. Another way is through our philanthropic uh, efforts to foster racial uh, and, and uh, equity and economic mobility. And then another example is really just through the power of our engaged employees with, uh, the, who volunteer their expertise, their time, and helping the community overall. So, you know, you heard a little bit about what's happening in, in Colorado Springs, but Bank of America is also growing in the state. In fact, we just added two financial centers right here to Colorado Springs. Last week, we just did a ribbon cutting at, in the uh, North Academy uh, Financial Center. So if you haven't seen our nice new modern financial center, go check it out. And in closing, look, you have our commitment. You have our commitment to collaborate and support environmental, economic, and social progress. You have our commitment. And we look forward to demonstrating that commitment right here in Colorado Springs. So, Thank you. I really hope you enjoy the event. Thanks for the time. Good seeing everybody. Thank you, Mr. Edelman, Bank of America, and all our partners who helped make this day possible. And now we have a woman who needs no introduction in our community, Dr. Tatiana Bailey, director of the UCCS Economic Forum, here to share the national, state, and local economic conditions and outlook. Tatiana, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it really is nice to see everyone in person again, but before I get started, um, I have to say I want to introduce two very special people. Uh, I think the second year um, I was here, I wanted to start a fellowship uh, for a couple of students. UCCS, you know, access is an issue. I'm a first generation student focusing on first-generation students or just high-need students in general. And we finally made it happen this past year. So I'd like to introduce Amanda Ford, one of our uh, fellows who was awarded um, this for this academic year, and also uh, Diego Hurtado, come on up as well. And they just want to say a quick word. 
Hi, I'm Amanda Ford. I'm a sophomore at UCCS, and I'm double majoring in business, international business and political science. And I just want to thank the sponsors of the Economic Forum for giving me this opportunity and letting me focus on academics and professional development this year. Hello, everyone. My name is Diego Hurtado. I'm a freshman at UCCS. I'm studying accounting. And I just want to thank everyone who donated, all the organizations and people who donated. Without this, this wouldn't be possible. Thank you so much. God bless America. Okay, that makes me really happy. Um, so I also uh, have a lot I'm going to be saying, but I also want to thank my few girlfriends who sent me uh, a text to say, hey, I like your dress. Because um, uh, any of you women who have daughters, you know, I showed this to my two daughters who were here, and they were like, oh, um, interesting. Um, Pan Am flight attendant circa 1960. Wow. Too late to change now. So anyway, they always keep you grounded, right, those kids? Okay, so... Always, always start with gratitude. That's what I tell my kids, too. Uh, forum founders, uh, two people who are very special in my life, in particular, Tom Zwerline and Ron Chernak, both retired now. A huge thank you to them. Just had them at my house the other night because Ron Chernak is also transitioning out uh, into retirement. Of course, all the community uh, sponsors, the partners of the UCCS Economic Forum. I think when we started, Tom, um, you know, Tom was a full-time professor, uh, had a handful of sponsors, and now we have about 60. I've always been overwhelmed by the level of support and positivity in this community. So a sincere thank you to all of you. Um, and a huge thank you to Rebecca. I know she's out there, but I, I have to say it. Um, the University of Colorado system, everyone, uh, including my colleagues at uh, CU's uh, Lead School of Business uh, in what they do in the resources that they provide, the state of Colorado government offices. I couldn't believe when I first got here how all of these people in Denver made themselves available to me to help me understand the state and local economy. Uh, the governor's office, you'll hear a little uh, clip from him at the end. Um, I'm on one of, I uh, was appointed by him uh, to be one of his nerdy economists, and they too provide a wealth of information for me uh, every month in those meetings. And then the media. I find that the local media here reaches out and they have a uh, true desire uh, to, to uh, bring out good information. So as, um, as was stated, yes, Rebecca and I are moving on to a new chapter. It's a little daunting, but um, very exciting. Rebecca is a K-12, former K-12 teacher. Now, when I was working part-time um, and homeschooling at the same time, uh, I worked for a nonprofit back in Michigan called Corporation for a Skilled Workforce. Always, always had a lot of interest in workforce as a mom and as an economist. Um, and really, a lot of it has to do with jobs are at the center of everything. That's how businesses function, and that's how households thrive. Um, so that's really what I'm going to be focusing on moving forward. Building more collaborations with community colleges. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, including Pikes Peak State College, Community College of Aurora, and now Pueblo Community College as well. Collaborating more uh, with our local K-12. Already have meetings set up with uh, three um, school districts uh, that I've worked with in the past, but now I can go a little bit deeper with them. They've actually reached out to talk about tweaking their continuing uh, technical education or career technical education uh, with some of the labor market information that Rebecca and I provide. Then we also wanted to scale what we do in some other communities. Over the past three, four, even five years, I was amazed at how many big cities bigger than ours would reach out and say, hey, stumbled across some of your data online or what you're doing with workforce in your community with some other uh, key players. Could we talk with you for a few minutes about how you're doing that? Um, so the ability to do that a little more um, is part of what we're also looking at. Um, so really, this new nonprofit is going to stay local, but it's also going to be across the country. Um, not so much doing our own thing as much as supporting the good work of other people with data. Um, and then I'd like to just end with uh, saying that I think we need all of the above mentality. We need economists. We need chambers enabling business growth. We need good government, uh, county and uh, city. 
ensuring that we have infrastructure, services, um, you know, that, that really help households and businesses thrive. I think we need all of these, uh, all of the above, so that we can reap those synergies between these organizations. And then, of course, here I have all the platinum level sponsors, the gold, the media partners, whoop, went way ahead there, and then the sustaining level partners. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to jump right in now. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, or actually a lot, about this overarching context. This is sort of the framework that I want you to keep in mind as I'm talking about the economic data. Now, if you talk to historians, which I'm not, uh, and you say to them, okay, well, what have been the major transitions uh, that we've had as humans? Uh, they would say probably six of them, big ones like fire, urbanization, and so forth. And it's usually like a millennia in between them, or certainly several hundred years. I sincerely believe, and I wrote an article about this a few weeks ago, that we have three transitioning, uh, transitions happening at the same time time right now, and we have almost 8 billion people on the planet. Food, that's due to a still increasing population on the planet, but we all know that climate impacts our ability to produce sufficient food and at attainable costs. That's the first one. The second one, energy. Due to the move towards alternative green energy sources, but we haven't really paid enough attention on how to do that sustainably. Perfect example is what's happening in Germany with natural gas and so forth. Very good intentions, very necessary, but those bridge sources haven't been very well coordinated between uh, countries. The third one, demographic. Due to stagnant or declining population in developed countries, causing labor shortages, we all know about that, right? Alongside increasing population in some of the poorest regions of the, um, of the uh, globe. Now, those are three really big transitions. So why is an economist talking about this? Because these impact both short-term and long-term sustainable growth. Now, are we in a recession? That's the big question right now, right? Well, we all know that we have labor shortages, too few workers, and a low labor participation rate. There you have it the demographics, I'm gonna talk a lot about that, short-term and long-term problem. This is due, this uh, demographic transition due to aging, lower birth rates, lower immigration, talk more about that in a minute, the skills gap. Consumer and business confidence is also not so hot, right? The high food and energy prices, again, both a short and a long-term problem, causing record inflation that we haven't seen in 40-some years. Supply shortages and disruptions, which is causing the Fed, with this high inflation, to have to raise interest rates. But will this restrictive monetary policy do the job? Because typically, interest rates go up in order to kill, or at least quell, demand. But most of these problems are supply issues. Right? So it's questionable how much impact uh, these uh, interest rate increases are going to have um, or what pain we're really going to have to withstand. And then I'm going to talk a little bit out about residential and commercial real estate and then some final thoughts. Okay, so are we in a recession? All right, Q1 of this year, we did have negative uh, uh, GDP growth, which is really a contraction of 1.5%, so negative 1.5%. Then we had Q2 at negative 0.6%, so almost flat, but still technically two consecutive quarters of GDP contraction. Usually that does mean a recession. Um, now, the Federal Reserve of uh, Atlanta does this GDP now where they're tracking it sort of in real time as the data points come in. So far, that's showing positive growth for the third quarter, okay? We won't know yet for, for a little while. And then really, it's this uh, group of eight economists, only eight economists, imagine that, National Bureau of Economic Research, that makes the final call whether it, we're in a recession or not. The uh, March-April of 2020 uh, contraction that we had was actually called uh, a recession, even though it, did, it didn't last for two consecutive quarters. Now, I'm thinking that in these transitions that I'm talking about, with these structural headwinds, I think big problems call for big solutions, especially when you have 8 billion people on the planet. I think it's going to be really important to, first of all, think longer term so that the problems that we have now, we can address them, okay? We can define the solutions as opposed to 
these problems defining us, okay, and our future trajectory. We're gonna have to innovate our way to the other side. A lot of times, the, the hardest challenges humans have had, we've, we've been able to use innovation in order to help us get to the other side. And then make sure you always seek out real data, okay? Look at it objectively and build solutions with a data-driven mindset. Um, you know, some of you have heard me say, um, in terms of data, I. When my kids were young, I put uh, you know, the top job openings and the projected uh, occupations growing the most on the fridge. Well, my kids are a bit older now, so now I say, hey, don't just look at your phones, not just snippets of information. Mom's on Fox 21 once a week. You can uh, watch, her, uh, watch her segments. She uses government source data. So I actually make them sit down and watch it, but it doesn't always go as planned. <laughs> so. I try, right? Okay, back to the big and bold solutions. All right, so if we talk about energy and food, those two transitions, they're highly correlated, interrelated. Food is transported, right, for the most part, so energy, high energy costs mean higher inflation. Reducing climate disasters um, increases food production and stability, for sure. If we focus on clean energy, which, by the way, employs three times the workers that fossil fuel extraction does now, with four million workers in the U.S., it's rapidly growing. That's a, a positive externality in terms of job creation. That median hourly wage for these types of jobs is 25% higher than U.S. median wages. And uh, this isn't from uh, Hugatree.com. This is actually a, a source that, um, that I rely on quite a bit. 52% of the world's new vehicle sales will be all electric by 2030. I checked that source all over and it's pretty consistent. So what if the government provided incentives to pivot more quickly? And some of that is in the Inflation Reduction Act. What does this do? It reduces emissions, mitigates the volatile world supply of uh, petroleum, it creates jobs, and it reduces inflation. How about if we also use fiscal stimulus to lead in this global energy transition and also train people for these jobs? And then, what about for the demographic transition? Well. One thing I'm definitely gonna be working on, study and raise public awareness on the top growing occupations. There just isn't enough information about that. Um, in schools, but then also in, in, gener in general in communities. Provide subsidized training. Free training is great, especially for certain income levels in, uh, or below. But sometimes you even have to subsidize training, kind of like what is done with uh, loans for doctors. Hey, we'll, we'll pay for your education if you work. Uh, afterwards for this many uh, years or months. It's a great use of tax dollars uh, since workers become taxpayers. We reduce welfare programs and increase global competitiveness. Provide incentives to higher ed to audit labor demand to the programs they offer with more emphasis on these high demand certifications and skills. And then a big one, we need to reform immigration. Now this is the one that I feel like we can impact more at the local level, which is part of why I'm doing what I'm doing moving forward. Okay, what about the current state of the labor market? Well, very low unemployment rate still, not seasonally adjusted, 3.8%. The July jobs report, over half a million new jobs, 528,000. Doesn't seem like a recession, does it? Remember though that the unemployment rate is low because it doesn't count all the people who haven't been looking for the last uh, four weeks. So if you add it all up, the unemployed 5.7 million people, 5.9 not actively in the labor force, but say they want a job, they just haven't looked in the last four weeks. You add that all up, the marginally attached part-time who want full-time, it's 11.1 million people. That's a lot of un or underutilized labor. Labor participation rate, that red line over there, never really recovered after the Great Recession. And some of this is, is more complex with aging that I'll talk more about in a minute. But in general, we can say the U.S. has half a worker for every open position. Most of the unemployed are young. So you think, oh, well, that explains a lot. But remember, the one, young ones <laughs> are the ones who are most actively looking for work. Okay, remember, you don't get counted in the unemployment rate unless you're actively looking for work. 
Now, how does this compare to other nations? I always like to look at this because if you look in the upper right-hand corner and you compare us to Canada, Germany, UK, and Australia, look at us in that teal line. Our labor participation rate for those prime working ages is lower. So there's a lot going on here. And even before the pandemic, look at what the Bureau of Labor Statistics says in terms of uh, labor participation by 2030. It's either flat or declining. So things are not gonna necessarily be getting any better. Same thing for El Paso County, declining labor participation rate, and we are younger. Look at the box in the upper right-hand corner. Our median age is about 35, Colorado's 37 and a half, US 39. So I feel like we should be going in the opposite direction here. So there's a lot of work to be done. So why do we have a shortage of bodies? Well, we need to remember, <laughs> Betty, Betty White, what a queen, right? Um, need to remember that the labor participation rate calculates all people ages 16 and up. I've made my phone calls to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. I don't think that's the way they should count it. We should only count working age people. Because remember, this means that we include senior citizens. Right now, the US has one in seven citizens who are 65 plus, and by 2030, it's gonna be one in five. So the main reason our labor participation rate is falling is because of the aging of our population. That is definitely true. And a lot of the boomers who maybe stuck around till they were 70, 72, they're just simply getting too old to work now and don't wanna work anymore. So if we look at true working age people, ages 16 to 64, the labor participation rate for that group is the same now as it was before the pandemic. So it's not the young and the restless or the young and the lazy, okay? And that participation rate is 76.3. And then we all know that women exited the labor force quite a lot during the pandemic. It's gotten a bit better, but look at the difference between 2019 and 2030. Child care is clearly an issue. This is another thing that needs big and bold solutions. It pays for itself. Rebecca and I did a study with the Legacy Institute a few years ago that showed the return on investment for just a FORS program for uh, low and uh, middle income uh, families is 19% in a given year. If you look at the long-term benefits for, for the kids in terms of better learning and better outcomes, it's actually a 30% ROI. That's pretty high. And then we can't forget that we have fewer children now than we did 10 years ago. People stopped having really big families many years ago, and now it's sort of coming to roost. Um, we also need to talk a little bit more about legal in, um, immigration. I mean, if we simply don't have enough bodies, we're gonna have to look to other parts of, of the globe. Speaking of that, look at that line for Africa. That's the only one that's really significantly increasing, as I stated earlier, poorer regions. Look at Europe, the magenta line. By 20, uh, 2050, I think it is, the UN projects that there's gonna be an even further decline by 20%. Uh, in the European population. Latin America is growing modestly, and they are probably our closest uh, geographically, um, so that's another reason, I think, to look at um, avenues to make them uh, legal citizens. And of course, the shortages are made worse by all of the quits that we have there at all-time highs. Now, you can see in the upper right, it is leveling off, but it's still record high levels, and this doesn't usually happen during recessions or recoveries. Now, this is actually a good thing. Another, po another thing that is impacting the shortage of, of, of uh, workers is that we have more self-employed people. That does usually happen during recessions because when people lose their jobs, they're more motivated to maybe start the business that they've wanted to start. And remember, this is a million more people who are saying they're self-employed compared to 2016, and those are the ones who are reporting that they're self-employed. Now, what about our demographics? Well, you can see we're the green bars and uh, we've always outpaced the US in terms of population growth rates, but look at how much it's been falling in the last few years. And it's for all the reasons I just talked about. Same thing for El Paso County, okay? We are still projected to be at almost a million people by 2050, um, but you know, definitely a declining rate of population growth. Most of our migration is in migration. Um, and then you can see over here, you know, Denver and El Paso County, not the MSAs, not the full cities, but the, the two counties have always kind of gone back and forth on who's bigger. Um, but it's pretty decidedly El Paso County now, as you can see in the bottom right. 
And then if you look at the entirety of the United States, you can see that the, um, the purple areas are the uh, ones with growing populations. Gray is kind of modestly growing. That's where we are. And then the orange ones are the ones with population decline, mostly the industrial belt. And then, you know, if we look at our growth uh, and we uh, do it by age, look at the two bottom lines, red and green, 18 to 29. That's still increasing. That is a huge comparative advantage. And then look at the US, those same two cohorts, completely flat. So we do have increase in young cohorts now, workers, potential workers. Look at the 30 to 49, the top bar for us, also growing. So this is a huge competitive advantage for us, but only if we train workers for the jobs of today. And then another important thing, look at how, what a large percentage of our population is going to be people of color by 2050. So we need to make sure that these cohorts have accessibility to really strong, good K-12 and post-secondary education because they are our future workforce as well. Skills gap. That's another major barrier. We need every worker we can get, so let's make sure we train them with relevant skills. So job openings aren't the problem. 11.2 million, look at how that's off the charts um, on the upper right. And yes, it is stabilized, but it's still at record levels. Many of the non-participants, uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics does surveys, say, hey, I stopped looking for work because I don't have the skill set that employers are asking for. It's a huge argument to be made for reskilling and upskilling people. And I uh, commend actually Pikes Peak Workforce Center as they focus a lot on that. And remember, about half a worker for each available job. We have openings across a lot of industries. This is not a problem just, for instance, for leisure and hospitality. We have government, education and healthcare, professional and business services, financial, trade and transportation, manufacturing. It's, it's all across the board, pretty much. And then look at the job openings in April of 2019, about 7 million, versus 11.2 million in 2022, uh, just this past month, up 55.6%. And then what about locally? How can we figure out what our skills gap is? Well, first of all, we have about the same uh, shortage of workers, about half a worker for each open job. Colorado's even tighter. That's mostly the Denver Boulder area and the ski communities, by the way, at 0.4 um, available workers per job. These are our top 10 job openings. I typically look at the top 30 or 40, but here are the top 10. The letters are the risk of automation, something we really need to pay attention to as well. And you can see the number of postings and the market salary. This is really good, important information that people should have, especially kids. And a total of about 27,000 job openings in the month of July, and that's local. So back to the big and bold solutions, closely examine the labor market in your region. That's number one. Look at the top occupations, the number of openings by occupation, the market salaries, the most demanded skills and certifications, and then juxtapose those uh, to those employer needs to the training programs that you have in your community. Do they match or don't they? Do they match well? Do we have the right programs? Are they at scale, at the scale that we need them to be for the hundreds or thousands of openings we have? That's how you actively build a pipeline of qualified workers. Most of the highly demanded occupations and skills do have livable wages. I look at that data every month. And remember that relevant training and good wages is also how you pull some of those workers back into labor participation. So I looked at this. This is the July data for our region. These are the top demanded certifications. Yes, things like a driver's license, you need to, uh, to drive in most, but also security clearance. A lot of IT jobs, like cyber certifications, network administrators, truck drivers, uh, certified nursing assistants, med technicians, phlebotomists, and so forth. All of those are really high demand, right? And then what about programming um, and software-related skills? Well, look at the top ones. This is just, that's just the Microsoft suite. Command again, Pikes Peak Workforce Center. Uh, we looked at this data together uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, and Tracy Marquez said, well, let me, let me see if I can get an online training program for the Microsoft suite that people can do at home. 
What a great idea, right? And then, of course, you have other ones that are mostly certifications, Linux, Java, SQL, C++, and so forth. Oops, it's a little touchy. Now, in juxtaposing these top occupations, you can literally list them out and then, in a handy Excel spreadsheet, say, hey, are those programs even offered locally? Right here, I have the ones that are offered by Pikes Peak State College. Yes or no? That's a start, right? And you know, as an example, Rebecca and I did in 2017 an audit of some healthcare positions. Look at medical assistants. We had 1,063 openings in 2017 and we trained 214 people. So a delta of about 850, that's a missed opportunity. Now, this is actually, I think, a really cool program that just passed this past week. It's called Care Forward Colorado. State of Colorado is going to be investing $26 million from COVID relief funds, guaranteeing free schooling for certain high-demand healthcare occupations. CNAs, emergency medical technicians, pharmacy techs, phlebotomy techs, medical and dental assistants. The program is effective for two years. We have funding for two years. It, re it got bipartisan support, right? Who, who would argue with this? It's going to reach about 4,000 students. Now, by 2026, Colorado is going to need... 54,000 entry-level healthcare positions. So you could say, oh my gosh, is this gonna make a dent? Um, hey, it's a start, right? And remember that a lot of these uh, technical training programs have career pathways. In fact, UC Health does something really cool with their um, uh, incumbent worker training and opportunities, and uh, we're gonna hear from that, um, from Ron Fitch on that. So right now, I'd just like to show an, uh, another example and testimony of um, some data-driven de decision-making by Dr. Brownlee. Take it away. The demands of today's world requires higher education to move faster and more efficiently than ever before. To take such action, it requires an institution that is deeply committed to responding to the needs of industry and its community in the midst of constant innovation and disruption. The Community College of Aurora understands our responsibility to serving our community as a vessel toward social and economic mobility to the nearly 11,000 students we serve. And we also understand our effectiveness in this work requires a systematic redesign of our current student experience. In partnership with the UCCS Economic Forum, CCA has gained access to critical economic forecast and industry data to reevaluate our course offerings and academic pathways. It was this critical information that provided the insight we needed to identify 27 programs for closure and place another 49 programs on a developmental improvement plan toward sustainability. Why? Because what good is an institution that awards credentials that don't lead to high wage, high demand positions designed to meet the needs of our growing and evolving economy? The future of our American workforce depends on higher education's ability to realize that now is the time for systematic change. I am Dr. Mordecai Brownlee, proud president of the Community College of Aurora. Pretty impressive, right? I did a presentation for the community um, college presidents in the state uh, in Pueblo, and uh, Dr. Brownlee came, came up to me and said, hey, can I talk to you some more? And I pulled some of that data for him, and I really commend 27 programs that he said were kind of tenuous to begin with, that the data helped support that those needed to be closed, and he needed to ramp some other ones. OK, back to big and bold solutions. I think another huge um, opportunity, yes, free community college or subsidized for Pell Grant recipients. By the way, the data shows it's not really very helpful unless you target it to the people who need it the most, and I tend to agree with that. Let's also utilize, fully utilize, public uh, universities, which often uh, give the higher level training um, at a much better cost, uh, as opposed to the private ones. And then I think a big one, too, look at how many veterans we have in El Paso County, 84,000. Um, as, as Ron knows, I call these low-hanging fruit. I mean, there's a, there are a lot of great communities or a lot of organizations that, uh, that are already doing wonderful work in this in terms of transitioning these. Um, but again, let's use the data to fully employ those, uh, those opportunities. Okay, so I don't think anyone argues um, workforce development is a golden opportunity, uh, especially if it offers livable wages. Uh, you get all political affiliations behind it. Um, 
What if we could choose to provide the paid training for the highest demand occupations as it raises labor participation, raises the tax base and home ownership, all while boosting business growth and global competitiveness? Some of the positive ripple effects that um, I know that this would bring is decreasing poverty levels, decreasing transfer payments, welfare payments, substance abuse, and crime rates. The highest crime rates are in your highest uh, areas of uh, unemployment, all while providing more opportunities for at-risk communities and chipping away at generational poverty. Okay, what about state and local labor markets, including wages? Well, this is the same unemployment graph, but now you can see Pueblo, El Paso, and Colorado. Um, our region in the state is very low. Remember that economists uh, say four to four and a half percent is the uh, natural rate of unemployment, uh, and we are well below that. Pueblo is a bit higher at 5.4 percent. This is how we compare. Pretty much all the MSAs in our region are somewhere in that three and a half range, except for Pueblo. These are our employments by sector, you can see. Um, Pretty, uh, pretty uh, diverse, if you will, for Colorado. Healthcare, retail, professional and technical, accommodation and food, construction, and so forth. I think one of the things that's really interesting is when the pandemic hit, people said, oh, states like Colorado are gonna hit, get hit especially hard because of the hospitality uh, uh, dependence, if you will. But look at we are so diverse with a lot of professional and technical and finance jobs and so forth, we did just fine. Also, we have outdoor sports. So that, that certainly helped. And then you can say pretty much the same thing about El Paso County. We're a little more reliant on healthcare uh, and social assistance, but still good representation in terms of employment across many sectors. And then if you look at the projections uh, from the Colorado Department of Labor, these are the sectors, the ones that have been growing a lot, that are projected to continue to grow. Look at what's transportation and warehousing, Amazon Prime, 7% uh, increase there. 67% additional employees projected um, by 2030 for us. And then I also like to pull this data to look at what are the new businesses being formed here? by sector. Look at the one with the biggest growth, professional and technical. And this is uh, comparing 2006 to 2021. Now, this is the, you know, kind of the bad news. Our wages are still lagging. Wages are horribly sticky. We have a long legacy of being at a lower average wage than both the U.S. and Colorado. It's kind of hoping that the pandemic numbers, as they started to come in, would start to close that chasm. Doesn't really look like it. El Paso County wages are about 14% lower than the U.S. and about 18% lower uh, than the state of Colorado, which is mo mostly uh, Denver Boulder. That's a problem. Now, it's a whole other presentation, and I do have theories behind this. Um, so it's, some of it is explainable, but a lot of it is also problematic, especially as I get to in a few minutes, the real estate section, you can't have lower wages uh, than the US and have higher median prices than the US in terms of housing. And then um, the one good thing is we do have a lower proportion of our population at 9% at or below the federal poverty level compared to the US at 12%. But I'd also like to show you this you know, livable wage that MIT does. For instance, let's look at a household with two adults, one of them working and two children. That one adult needs to make $80,000 a year in order to just meet necessities. Sorry about this. Um, okay, and then that tied to that, I think we also have to pay attention to wealth inequality. I did a paper in early, uh, early 2020 that looked at wealth inequality, income inequality, three different ways. I personally think that the best one is not income but wealth. And that's because it incorporates assets, right? Like does somebody own a home or a car or whatever. The Federal Reserve tracks this data. The top 1% of the United States uh, that top shelf there, uh, the dark green, had 32% of the wealth in the United States, and the bottom 50% had 2.4% of the wealth. That's that little skinny uh, red line at the very bo uh, bottom. I don't think you can find an economist that thinks that that's sustainable. Um, so I think that's also something structural that we need to pay attention to. And I do think that it's also a lot of the reason that we have the polarization that we do. There is a professor named Scott Galloway who I listen to pretty routinely from uh, NYU Stern School of Business. He, he cited a study that said 60% of Americans think that the opposing political party, people in the opposing political party, is the quote, enemy, the word enemy. 
And I liked what he said. He was astounded by that. And he said, our greatest ally will always be other Americans. So let's also talk a little bit about post-secondary education costs in the US because this is also exacerbating our labor shortages. We are at 43% of our population in Colorado having at least a bachelor's degree, second most uh, educated, compared to the US at 32%. But we're also one of the worst states in terms of the proportion of tuition that students have to pay at public institutions. So there's a bit of a mismatch there, right? And remember, we also have a lot of in-migrants, so a lot of the people who live here got educated somewhere else. Also, enrollments are down. Uh, compared to 2021 to 2020, for instance, in Colorado, enrollments are down 5%. Now, some of this is the demographics that I talked about, but there's also a bit of a shift going on in terms of what type of education do you need in order to get um, a sustainable job and a livable wage job? Student loans, we all know, are a problem. Student uh, debt now amounts to 1.75 trillion with 43 million borrowers. That's more than credit card debt. Federal average student loan is about 37,000 and 55,000 for black borrowers. 20 years after entering school, half of the uh, borrowers still owe 20,000. I think about home ownership, right? And wealth accumulation there. And it's ubiquitous. Today, 70% of college grads have student loans. Okay, so this permeates, right, all throughout the economy. And completion is still a problem. On a weighted average basis for the different types of institutions, about half of university level students who enroll do not graduate by the end of their sixth year. And at that point, it's pretty unlikely that they're going to. So how much of this is attributable to costs that I just talked about? Probably. Academic readiness, probably. And income inequality, probably. All of the above. Back to the big and bold solutions, Pell Grant recipients, I think actually should have access to more free training. And that can be higher ed, it can be certification, um, because this is also gonna help address the wealth gap. It's good training and good jobs, that's how you break that generational poverty. Okay, so what about some other important metrics? All right, so savings um, rates, it's interesting. I don't think this is talked about enough. They're now at about 5%, and they were at about 8% before the pandemic. I don't think we're looking at that quite closely enough. Delinquency rates on credit cards are going up a little bit, but not too bad, right? Nothing like the Great Recession. But we are starting to see a little bit more reliance on credit card. And remember, the interest rates on those credit cards are going up. Now, 8.5% uh, inflation was the latest read in July, down from, I think it was 9.1%. Um, but remember, always look at baseline effects. That 8.5% is from a year ago, 12 months ago. But prices started to increase at 4% or more in April of 2021. So any of the increases we're now seeing are on top of the increases 13, 14, 15 months ago. So keep that in mind. Also, the cost of living index for Colorado Springs is now at 104.1%, uh, meaning we're about 4.1% more expensive than the uh, average US city. It was lower than 100, by the way, uh, when I got here. Now, part of the problem with inflation is how broad-based it is, right? Look at it, it it's, it's across many goods and necessities and, and big components of household budget, food, gas, uh, electricity, shelter, which by the way is gonna keep feeding these inflation numbers because that metric lags significantly and uh, cars and trucks. And then of course the big problem is that even with the wage increases we've seen, if inflation is this high, real wages are down 3%. That's a big problem. So this puts the Fed between a rock and a hard place, absolutely, ha having to raise interest rates, but as I said, a lot of our problems are supply side issues, and this is attacking it more from the demand side. And then I'll give you a peek in the forecasts. I'm actually thinking the Fed funds rate is gonna have to go to 4% with inflation being what it is, which is a little bit higher than what a lot of other uh, economists say. And now what about the consumer confidence I talked about? Well, I was really surprised to see University of Michigan, first game, by the way, on Saturday against uh, CSU. Um, anyway, uh, here you can see that Consumer confidence is lower than it was during the Great Recession. 
thought, that can't be right. But then if you read the detail, it's all about inflation. That's why it's as low as it is. Good time to buy? Clearly not. That's kind of fallen off a cliff, right? <laughs> Unbelievable. And then this, people have said to me, wait a second, retail sales are good though. Come on, things aren't so bad. It's in dollars. You see that jump over there on the upper right hand? That was April. Literally, that was April 2021 when prices really started to increase because this is, this is incorporating uh, uh, dollars. Now, yes, some of this was uh, you know, people buying more things, especially when they were at home and it's leveled off, um, but you know, it is highly skewed by inflation. S&P 500, I mean, this is really crazy. Uh, thanks to Brian Lang, I got some help uh, from uh, Merrill Lynch in terms of looking at this sort of the right way, because there are many ways to look at it. I think this 12-month uh, moving average is the best, going back to 2015. You can see, look, all right, different uh, percentage increases in the S&P 500, but look at 2021, 31.2% increase. Uh, that's overvalued, right? So no big surprise that year to date we're only at 1.3%. There's a lot of correction. Okay, and then I also like to look at local consumer confidence. Um, I, I can't do it all by myself, so I just rely on new vehicle reg registrations, things like that, pretty steady for the last many years. Luxury up 67% over the last uh, three years. Uh, so that tells me people who have money are spending it, right? And then if I look at sales and use tax, that's also been up, but it's also measured in dollars. But at least it never had fell off a cliff like we thought it might during the pandemic. And then business confidence. Here you can see that's also not so good over there on the right-hand side. And if you look at the surveys, you can see that 37% um, say inflation is their number one problem. No great surprise. The highest level since 1979. 20% of businesses plan to create new jobs. Ah, What's gonna happen with the labor market? I don't think that's going off a cliff either. 48% of respondents say they have increased compensation, wage inflation, there you go, right? Wage price spiral. About 50% of owners say they couldn't fill job openings and 91% of them said they had few or no qualified applicants. All right, now I'm gonna transition into housing. Real estate makes up about 12 to 15% of GDP if you include all those components. And then I pay a lot of attention to this because it's A, usually the biggest uh, amount that a household has to spend every month, but also it's the primary mechanism for wealth accumulation. Here, this is US existing single family home prices. You can see that you know during the pandemic almost became logarithmic and July is still high at 411,000. Double digit high double-digit increases um, a year ago and for most of this past year, now moderating but still increasing. Home sales have definitely cooled because of the higher, uh, higher interest rates. That's not a huge, huge surprise. And this is for new homes. And then permits are now down about 12% compared to a year ago. And the National Association of Home Builders, in their survey, they are not as optimistic. They are uh, quite cautious now. Home ownership rates, um, we get spotty data from El Paso County, but you can see that in the early 2000s, we were closer to 70% and we're now about 65%. Here you can see all but one of the 185 um, MSAs, cities that were uh, tracked by National Association of Realtors showed gains in single family homes in um, the past quarter. 80% still had double digit growth. Now it is cooling, but it's not, again, falling off a cliff. 100% of condo homes increased. And then you can see median prices over the past year up 14%, condo 12, 12, almost 13%. And then National Association of Realtors is actually saying for this year, home prices are gonna overall, over the course of the whole year, have about an 11.5% increase in prices still with the amounts there and almost 9% for new homes, but then pretty flat for next year. Okay. I'll get it right, there we go. Delinquency rates, um, I keep an eye on this as well, and they went up a little bit after the pandemic, but uh, they have stayed uh, pretty, pretty manageable thus far. Existing home sales have actually decreased uh, for six straight months. Year over year sales have decreased 20%, okay? So again, cooled, but a year ago it was really hot. 
32% um, overall price growth in the past two years, 32% on average in the US. Now this, Moody Analytics did this, and I found this fascinating. I don't know how they do this, but a lot of people pay attention to it. Housing market is 24.7% overvalued, slightly higher than what it was during the Great Recession. That's alarming. 84% of the US markets are considered overvalued and some are much worse, like Boise. Look at that, 72% overvalued. And I'll, I believe it because I'll show you some data in a second. And then Moody's is actually ex expecting a depreciation of five to 10% in the next year. And then a couple of slides on Colorado real estate. We are unfortunately still one of the most expensive states uh, in the United States in terms of home prices. And then this is from uh, Leeds School of Business. Um, you can see here that the dotted line shows you the number of permits issued for single and multifamily match 2002. All of that delta, we underbuilt. And this is also true across the United States. We have a shortage, according to the experts, of 6.5 million homes in the United States. And this is part of the reason I also think that housing is not gonna fall off of a cliff. If you have that much of a shortfall, there's still gonna be some demand out there. And then in terms of apartments, we are r ranked the eighth um, highest state in terms of um, apartment rentals. Uh, you need about $30 an hour to rent an average two bedroom apartment in our, in our state. Um, and at the min our minimum wage, that would mean 75 um, hours a week of work. And then local real estate, in 2006, our local median home price was 8% below the US, and at the end of 2021, it's worse now, we're 22% above the US. And remember what I was showing you about wages being 14% uh, below uh, Colorado? That's a definitely a problem, okay? And then over here, you can see um, for new and existing in our region, um, look at our average home price in July, and look at our increase it's been a lot more precipitous, and now we're almost at a logarithmic level. And this is a lot of the reason that I think things are gonna moderate for us. And up there, you can see the average and median home price, average being about 560,000. Average days on market is 14. That's still pretty quick turnaround for homes. And then this I did for uh, one of the um, media segments I do. Look at from July of 2019 to July of 2022, our average home price has increased 49.6%. Unbelievable. All right, and then here, if I had to guess, and I have called a lot of my colleagues uh, in the real estate industry, this is where I think prices are gonna end up on average for 2022, and those are in the boxes in the upper right-hand co um, corner there. And I will tell you too that the median home price in our region is moderating, it's even seen a, uh, some declines over the last uh, couple of months, modest declines, much more than average home price. Why? Because the people who have money are buying the really big, uh, the really big and expensive homes. And then here's uh, the forecast in the actual dollars, up for us uh, in 2022, 10% for the median and up 9.7% um, for uh, the, uh, the median home price. And then foreclosures, I got a little nervous up there in the, um, on the right-hand side, but they seem to have come back to, uh, to a level that is pretty much what it was pre-pandemic. Hopefully it'll stay that way. And then this is just showing um, our appreciation compared to some uh, other MSAs across the United States. And I, I found this kind of hard to believe. I mean, look at, what about Fort Collins? How did Fort Collins become so expensive? Um, and then look at Boulder, 933,000 for the median home price in Q2. And then I also wanna show you that most of this, the home sales in the United States are between that 100 and 500,000 range, and we are at between 300 and 800,000, okay? So that's definitely pulling up our average as well. And then that same graph that I showed you for Colorado, this is it for our region. And I've calculated, US has a shortfall of 6.5 million homes, ours is about 12,000. Same type of methodology that I used. And then this one, I actually have an article coming out a week from uh, Sunday. This is called the Housing Opportunity Index, and that shows the percentage of median-priced homes that are affordable to the uh, median home, uh, median uh, income home. Okay, so well, basically, what people can afford. Look at where we are. 
23%. As recently as uh, Q3 of 2019, we were at 71.4%. We pulled these numbers like three times because we couldn't believe how, how much lower all of these cities got. Unbelievable. So we'll see if we're going to have uh, the type of correction that some are saying. So we're going to continue to have upward pressure um, on interest rates, slowing in migration, stock market volatility. All of these things are going to moderate home prices, right? Number of listings should continue to increase. That's going to help moderate prices. So instead of having like 20% appreciation, we're probably going to be down closer to the 10%. That's the recap. And then just a couple of slides on apartment. Uh, you can see that um, the uh, lease rates are still going up in our region quite a lot, but vacancies are still really low. So that tells me that, uh, you know, prices are probably about, you know, people are still demanding it. Housing and urban development is still calling us a slightly tight market. So that kind of validates what, uh, what I'm seeing and hearing from uh, my colleagues in uh, apartment. And then what is the fair amount that, could, that should be paid according to the Low Income Housing Coalition? If we took a 40%, so just kind of a very average apartment in Colorado Springs at $1,300, uh, an average person would need to make about $25 an hour, uh, $52,000 a year, but the average renter in our region makes about $19 an hour. And this is where I worry about the workers who want to come here and stay here but can't afford to live here. And of course, it's much worse than, for instance, the mountain communities. And then you can see here, we are still cheaper than Denver and the US at 1,700 per month, but not by much. And those vacancy rates are still very low. And of course, as interest rates go up and more people can't afford to buy a home, they're gonna have to rent, right? So that keeps demand up as well. Brief comments on commercial real estate. The record low construction that we had in 2021 in retail, multifamily, and office actually helped. Uh, it it kind of kept the market stable, if you will. Industrial, the star, hands down, of the past two years. Super high demand and lots of construction. Office vacancy rates in the U.S. right now are at 18.4%, okay, a little bit higher than last year. But that's not as true locally because we didn't have a lot of excess product to begin with, okay? Our, our vacancy rate is 9.4%. The physical occupancy in the U.S. is 40%. I, I found that really hard to believe. So if you walk into the average uh, office building right now, it's only about 40% full. So there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot, not a lot of investment that's going on. Negative absorption of 8.4%. McKinsey did a large uh, study looking uh, with 25,000 people in the spring, and it showed that 58% of Americans have at least one day a week that they're working from home, 35% that are fully remote. And the third most common reason for quitting is because of no remote options. So I'm not an expert on this, but a lot of experts who are say work from home to some degree is here to stay. And that, of course, impacts the office uh, category here. Multifamily, you know, off the charts. Record growth, uh, never seen it um, in the, you know, 40 years they've been tracking it. 17% growth in effective rents. Vacancy rate of 4.5% across the U.S. And still high absorption. Retail, everyone thought it was going to fall off the cliff during the Great Recession, um, but it was already adjusting. So rents and vacancy rates are actually still pretty flat. E-commerce is now about 15% of all commerce, so that's certainly impacting that. Um, and then the vacancy rate is at 10.3% nationwide uh, for smaller retail and 11% for malls. Industrial, super low vacancy rate of 5%. Effective rents are still going up, and asking rents still up 12% year over year. And then this is what our local market looks like. And you can see our vacancy rates are pretty consistently lower than the U.S. And then lastly, um, growth forecasts, better known as guessonomics. Um, I always like to talk to young people. Um, you know, I have five kids, so I talk to them a lot. And I said, you know, what, what do you guys think? Are we in a recession? You know, what's going to be happening? And this is what I got. <laughs> Look at the guy in the middle there, right? All right, so uh, it's a little bold to make any forecasts right now, but I'm actually sticking pretty close to what the conference board says. They are saying that we're going to end up this year at a very modest growth rate of 1.3%, um, and next year, pretty flat. 
0.2%. Um, you know, and I think it's something like 60% of economists are saying we're going to hit a recession uh, next year if we're not technically in one now. And then here you can see uh, they are saying that we're going to have stagflation, which is basically uh, inflation alongside little to no GDP growth. And that's because of inflation and higher interest rates, supply chain issues, mostly in China, Ukrainian crisis affecting commodity prices, a certain recession in Europe uh, with probably uh, 18 to 20 percent inflation rates. Uh, now, the Inflation Reduction Act here should help a little bit, $400 billion, but we're not going to see the benefit of that until probably late 2023 or 2024. That's just how these things work as they roll out. Um, the, actually, it's Wells Fargo who's saying inflation for this year is going to end up at 8 percent and about 3.5 percent for next year. Uh, consumer spending is going to only increase 2 percent and then be flat, okay, basically moving forward. Residential investment down this year 5.5% and down another 4.7% next, um, next year. That should actually be 2023. Unemployment rate holding steady around 3.6% this year and 3.7% next year. And I agree with that for all the workforce reasons I already talked about. And then something I think is not being talked about enough, I think we're still going to have a lot of volatility in imports and exports because of the strong dollar. So that's another monkey wrench. Uh, that's out there. And then this is the same graph, but with the state and local growth rates, you can see there, um, I'm actually forecasting the gross state product for 2022 to be a little bit higher than the US. It's typically how it's been for Colorado at 1.5%. And I'm pretty bullish on Colorado Springs at 1.6%. And that's how quickly we re rebounded in jobs and so forth during the Great Recession. And basically all the momentum we have going here. And then, yes, constrained growth next year, but still at higher rates than the U.S. Unemployment rates, as I said, holding steady. Again, a little bit lower than the U.S. Uh, for Colorado and El Paso County. And then I'll just uh, kind of end by saying I really am uh, overall bullish for Colorado and Colorado Springs. It's not as much population growth, but it's still growing. Still young and educated people, we've become more of a destination for knowledge workers with remote work. Diversity of sectors, a lot of innovation, still very robust tourism, a lot of growth in professional and technical, including Department of Defense, Finance, Insurance, Healthcare. And then we do have higher labor participation here uh, than uh, the rest of the United States, and we still have a lot of nice growth in uh, downtown. And then here you can see some metrics on tourism. Look at how we're beating out Denver right here. Look, hotel occupancy. Um, we just uh, have become more and more of a destination. Look at employments and so forth. And then um, I'm going to end with gratitude as well. Um, I think one person I really want to uh, thank is um, my husband. When we moved here um, eight years ago, uh, I had been working part time. Uh, homeschooling for several years and my husband really stepped up uh, you know he saw me busy and so forth and you know he's picked up the uh, the cooking and uh, all kinds of things around the house so I thank him um, he does wear goggles with uh, onions <laughs> and then um, in two days on Saturday uh, we're gonna be married for 34 years <laughs> yep I did have to get a note from my parents to get married on that day in September of 1988. And, and, and then that's us. Um, just uh, like two weeks ago uh, at a Canadian wedding. Um, my husband's Canadian. So um, thanks to my husband for putting up with me and for um, you know enabling me to do all the things that I like to do, including the, the next chapter. Um, it's been a very productive uh, marriage, as you can see. <laughs> Um, these are uh, our kids at a gin distillery, um, so thanks to them as well. I think I have three of them here tonight. Um, so thanks again, and um, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Tatiana. Incredible information, and congratulations on 34 years. Now, please help me welcome Kimberly Sherwood. Kimberly will guide a short conversation with Tatiana and we'll be back to moderate our panel following a short break. Kimberly. May I do the Q&A announcement? Yeah. Okay. So you do the microphone. I okay. have a computer. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, 
doing this, I guess. Okay. Do yep. you want to stand up? No, no, it's okay. all good. David, would you mind uh, reminding people of the instructions for posing questions? Or I guess I can do it. It's on the back of your ticket, I think, right? The yeah. back of your agenda. The back of the agenda has meeting pulse where you can submit some questions. And I think because we started late, we'll probably uh, keep Q&A a little bit on the shorter side. But I am available for a couple of questions. So uh, w we want to do it with technology, so bear with me. I have, I am a Luddite. How about somebody up front asks me a question? <laughs> I can hear you. Don't be shy. Question. Yes. Talk about energy prices going two years out. Wow, energy prices two years out. Well. Everything that I see okay. and hear and read um, says that you know we're going to continue to have the volatility, which is part of the reason that I uh, really like to emphasize moving away from that volatility and that dependence. Uh, yes, we do produce energy here in the United States, but we know that um, that it has issues. Uh, and again, we haven't built bridge energy sources the way that we need to. So I think that volatility is going to continue. But what the experts also say, Ron, is that um, the overall longer term trend, it is not a renewable uh, resource. And that, that, you know, that specific commodity is going to continue to increase. It's going to go like this a lot, but the trend line is still going to be upward. Um, you know, I don't, I don't really see any, any way around it. Now, the interesting thing, if we're really going to have 50% of uh, all vehicles by 2030 being uh, electric globally, that's going to pivot everything very, very quickly. And that's, I think, where we're finally going to start to see some transition. Now, petroleum products are in just about everything, including Trek decks, I mean, all of that. So it's not going away. Um, but I think once we hit that pivot point is really where you're going to start to see um, stabilization and even decline in, in uh, petroleum products. Yeah, we're going to be talking more about that in the panel, uh, and you know, and we have certainly some experts. You know, I I think a lot about ed education, right? Because um, the private sector, you know, they know what they need. You ask a business, and they say, "I need this, this, and this." The issue is that other people don't know, right? The would-be workers don't ne necessarily know. The kids who are coming out of high school don't necessarily know. So a lot of it is education. That's that's on the on the supply side. Employers increasingly are saying, I'm going to do this myself. I'm going to partner with a community college or a technical school. And even here, I know that, uh, for instance, Pikes Peak State College even offers training at the work site in order to help with the, uh, the skills building uh, that, these, uh, that these businesses are asking for. So incumbent worker training and when businesses can afford it, and not all small businesses can, but when they can, to really provide that as a benefit uh, because they're going to benefit longer term as well. So Tatiana, one of the questions, this is a very localized question, is uh, what should be done about Tabor and should that be, should we get rid of it? <laughs> wow. <laughs> it just came up on the list. I'm just going to say it, okay? Um, I think we need to get rid of Tabor. I know. Um, yeah. no, no tomatoes or eggs, please. <laughs> well, and I, and I think that that's great. And you know, that some people say that's politically motivated and so forth. Part of the reason is, you know, we are a growing state. That's the issue, you know? I mean, I lived in Michigan for many years, and that's a declining, um, you know, population there. When you have the type of growth that we do, you need infrastructure, you need the maintenance, you need new type of infrastructure, you need to make sure that the schools are getting everything that they need and so forth. And I'm not just, and I'm not one of those people that said, just throw money at it. No, you have to do it responsibly, but 
A lot of these investments are investments that have a very positive ROI down the road. Why? Because it makes things easier for businesses. It makes things easier for commuting. All of the different things. Um, so I think for every dollar you put in that, you know, the opportunity cost of those Tabor dollars, I think you're usually, for the most part, getting more than a dollar out. And I think we need that in our state, quite honestly. Well, thank you. Uh, this is um, the time at which we're ready for a break. So it's yeah. 3.05 and... <laughs>